Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Facebook, YouTube. This is Winfield Pentecostal Assembly uh, coming on Sunday for our, our uh, weekly Sunday school lesson. I'm going to make some adjustments to the feed. Praise the Lord, Facebook, YouTube. All right. We're here for another Sunday school. Praise the Lord, everybody. We're so glad to be able to do this again. Uh, we were absent on Friday. I got stuck at work, but we're here live today. We thank God for another Sunday school. All right, just as in the way of announcements, uh, we have in-person worship services every Sunday evening at 5 p.m. at 7416 East 109th Street in Crown Point, Indiana. Uh, it's in the town of Winfield. It has a Crown Point mailing and GPS address, but we're in the town of Winfield, Indiana. And we're in the building of Christ Presbyterian. So you won't see Winfield Pentecostal necessarily on the on the on the signs and whatnot, but you will see Christ Presbyterian. We are inside of that building. Every Sunday evening, except for July the 4th, it seems July the 4th falls on a Sunday. And our host church has decided not to have worship services on that day. Uh, instead, they want to try to do something with inside of the community and basically what I surmise is going to happen is that uh, there's always a parade, a 4th of July parade on the 4th of July, and they want uh, they want to basically allow for everyone to participate in the parade or to view the parade or uh, something like that. So they have canceled in-person services for that day, and thereby they have they've arbitrarily canceled our services for the day. So we will not be having in-person services on the 4th of July. Um, we will have a, uh, we will move our streaming for our Sunday school lesson up to 10 o'clock uh, instead of at 12.30 uh, Central Standard Time, we will move our streaming up to 12, uh, 10 o'clock, 10 a.m we will stream our Sunday school lesson and that will be the only service for the day. Uh, we won't have any other service for that, that, that 4th of July. And I'll keep making this announcement as we get closer to the 4th of July. Um, the other announcement is if you would like to uh, contact us, or I'm sorry, if you'd like to give to our ministry, you could do so through the Givelify app, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y, and look for Winfield Pentecostal Assembly and you can make your donation. And as I always uh, try to remind those, we do not use your donations for anything other than, don than church related uh, items. We don't use it personally. So uh, you can make your donation um, and, feel, and feel good about the fact that you're supporting a local ministry trying to get uh, its roots into the local community. Um, if you would like to, um, um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah. So if you'd like to get in touch with us, you could do so uh, through the uh, WPAssembly at Outlook.com is our email address. Uh, get in touch with us and let us know um, that you made a donation. If you just made a general donation, uh, but if you made, if you're paying, if you're paying tithes, to us, through us, or you're supporting the Sunday school, um, just let us know. Because what I would like to do is send you a Sunday school book so you can keep up with us uh, throughout the year. Uh, but you do not have to support the ministry in order for us to minister to you. Um, I've I already own the rights to the Sunday school lesson to distribute it. So if you would like a copy of the Sunday school lesson, um, let me know. WP assembly at outlook.com and I'll send you a digital copy through to your email of the Sunday school lesson. 
All right, that's all I have in way of announcements. Um, today, our, um, our uh, Sister Mabel is going to lead us in our Sunday school. Uh, how will the Lord lead, gives, and gives to her? We're going to yield to her. Uh, she's teaching uh, lesson number two. Say, Avery, hey, how could you call me Sister Mabel? I call you First Lady Evangelist Mabel. But our daughter, uh, Sister Adrielle, is going to uh, lead us in the Sunday school lesson. And th that's lesson two, June the 13th. Today is June the 13th. Uh, lesson two of the summer session, which is located on page 12 of the Living Word series, volume three, uh, printed by PentecostalPublishingHouse.com. The Word of Flame. Word of Flame Manual, uh, the series is The Living Word, uh, Volume 3. And at that time, we're going to say a quick prayer, and then we're going to yield the floor uh, to Sister Adrielle Mabel. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for another a Sunday school. We thank you for another opportunity to assemble and to teach and preach and, and to learn more about you. Lord, I pray that you would even be with us right now. That you was that you would just speak through all of us that we all learn not only us but those that are watching now and for years to come. We thank you for the opportunity. We pray that you be with us in Jesus' name. Jesus Amen. 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 Sister Mabel. All right. Um. So the word is rightly or the title is rightly dividing the word. Uh. We can just start with the focus of thought. All right. To know. You want us to read it to, with yeah, you? Yeah. Okay. Read it to, to know Jesus in his fullness, we should, should be diligent in studying God's word. Um, so I um also whenever if you guys have like any questions or anything or like anything to input and lesson, feel free anytime. Um we can start reading that text. So I'll start with the focus first, which is studying to show first Second Timothy 2, verse 15. Studying to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenus and Philetus, uh, Philetus, who concerning the truth have ear, erred, erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrown, overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having his having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Yeah. Um, so in studying this lesson, I like came up with, and we'll go through the lesson text. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, like just if you have any input, you know, whatever you, you know, like want to say something, that's fine. But when I was studying the lesson, um, a few like kind of like themes, I guess, like resonated with me, and uh, some of those are truth, acceptance. So acceptance, like being accepted of God. And then also like being accepted of like like the world or like the church if you're a pastor um power sacrifice kindness your calling and in, in god judgment and wisdom um and also the uh, idea of like teaching or leading or like apprenticeship which is what um timothy was to Paul, he was his apprentice. Mm -hmm. And then I read 2 Timothy chapters 2 and 4. Uh, we can go through those two to kind of get the background of, um, of the lesson a little bit more. 
But 2 Timothy, the second chapter, which is where the lesson text comes from, talks about like being the servant of God. Um, and it's just Paul's like letter to the church on how to like be a servant to God. Um, and what that means to be a servant of, to God. And then the fourth chapter, uh, what I got from that was Paul's journey. So like he was also uh, writing to Timothy again. And he was like kind of giving him warnings mm -hmm. in the chapter. And he was telling him the importance of preaching the word in season and out of season, no matter like who's with you and who's not with you. And he talked about his journey of how like people left him and how God was with him and how... God kept him despite of people leaving him through his journey. So he was writing this from prison, which I thought was interesting too. But um, we can start at uh, verse 1. Uh, so, though therefore my son be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. I'll tell everybody again, remind everybody again where you're reading from because they may be looking at the Sunday school lesson just in case oh, yeah. they, they didn't follow what you're doing now. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so we're going to be reading 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting at verse 1. Basically, what we're doing is we went up Yeah. from our so focal, let's... our focus uh, theme, and we're basically what she's trying to do is give us a background mm -hmm. of where our lesson is coming from. Yeah. yeah. So we moved, went up, instead of starting at verse 14 or 13, 14, we're now at verse 1. Mm-hmm. So, though therefore, starting at verse 1, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And then we can just... Uh, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. So, therefore, endure hardness as a good soldier for, of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that labored must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord gives thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not found. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, sakes, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So that's the first part leading up to 14, uh, which is where lesson starts. And then we already read 14 to 19, so then we can start at 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor, and to some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender stripes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patient in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves if god peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledge acknowledging of the truth and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil 
who are taken captive by him at his will. So it's just kind of like a little background, um, but he like instructs instructs us on how to like live this life and um, some things like I said that are like even throughout the chapter is um, sacrifice to, to, to follow that calling which God has given you mm -hmm. and to follow what he says to you to be obedient and also um, teaching and leading so um, it like kind of mentions that like we are at one time we were the people that were being taught that were being led and now and then it, there's going to come a time where we're going to be the people teaching leading um, and guiding the next generation so um, the, in the culture connection which is on page 13 um, it talks it mentions how the Bible is everything we need to hear from God learn about God know the plan of God feel the heart of God and do the will of God so it's our our guidance in this life it's through the Bible that we know how how to be a good Christian how to live safe and it's how we connect to God you know through the stories and um, the wisdom that it gives like we're able to to know how to live um, this life and um, at the bottom it mentions contemplating the topic of bottom of 13 and it says although there are some things we can do it yourself DIY there are also a great deal of tasks where expert help is absolutely necessary. Having a Bible does not make someone a minister. Mm -hmm. In fact, reading and studying the Bible does not guarantee we will become productive and effective ministers. In our lesson text, Paul gives Timothy some guidelines to bring develop his ministry that we should take to heart today. Mm -hmm. So even even though this is this lesson mainly it talks about the relationship between um, or like basically establishes I guess guidelines for minister mm -hmm. pastor it does yeah I was like when I was reading I was like why did he I don't know what yeah. how to teach you sit on that pastor but no you don't have to be I mean it really can be for anyone because if you're trying to witness to someone or um, like guide someone through a certain like auxiliary in a church or anything like or just live like a safe life like you still need to know these things mm -hmm. um because studying the word is something that we all should do and like i don't do it as much as i as i should um but it's so important you know like we we go through life and we prioritize other things over like reading the word you know and it's it's if we do read the word more we can get that close relationship with god and we can um overcome like those strongholds that we have in our life you know those temptations when we learn about the word we can recite those scriptures in our mind we can remember those things and when those times come when we, where we want to fall those scriptures will go through our mind and that will give us strength to endure you know those times so that's why it's so important and then um Page 14 talks about, at the bottom, where it says young pastor Timothy. Um, it just talks about the relationship that Paul and Timothy had. So they were, um, Paul was uh, like leading Timothy, like I said, and Timothy was his apprentice. And uh, we've talked about this before, about, you know, just leading the next generation and like, I guess, like tradition in different churches and how um like some churches do establish that like i guess that um like they do establish the next generation they do try to give opportunities and then others don't but it's so important to lead the next generation and not only that but just like if you see a, a soul in need like to be there for them if you can help them in any way like use what you can to help them you know and it doesn't have to be like administering them uh, or in like helping them to become a minister it can just be soul winning so mm -hmm. just leading them guiding them being a mentor to them 
if they're going through something you went through you can still be that person for them you know it doesn't have to be that they're trying to be an usher or what have you so um i thought that was so important because like we talked about how judgmental the church can be and if like that prevents this from happening you know like being judgmental and not having like charity and love and kindness about about the way we like approach others like that can prevent this from happening you know um so that was on 14 and then 15 it talks about the top it says letter a it says paul exhorted timothy to study so it outlines the scripture, 2 Timothy 2 and 15, which says, study to show thyself approved unto God. And it says, in other words, it would be his diligent study that would garner God's approval. It would be his continued study that would produce and maintain Timothy as an effective minister. The same is true of ministers today. Ministers who stop studying cannot take the congregation any further. The minister's failure to grow spiritually governs the potential growth of the congregation. An effective minister is knowledgeable in the word of God, Christian theology, Christian spirituality, and pastoral care of all believers from young to old. In addition to the above tasks, the contemporary minister must may wish to become proficient in finances, nonprofit leadership, building maintenance, ethical conduct, and other legal matters. It is through knowledge and genuine care that ministers receive approval and fidelity from the congregation they serve. So, like, just having the Word of God, like, in you is just so important because it leads you, um, like, to be an effective, effective, not only effective Christian, but just, like, an effective individual in the office that God has you to be in, you know, he can speak to you through his word and it is living, you know? And then this is where the theme of acceptance that I got comes into play. Um, and letter B it talks about seek approval from God. So it says not only does the minister look for approval, acceptance and assurance from the congregation, but most important, the minister seeks approval from God. At the end of the day, what matters most is not a pleased congregation, but a God who is pleased with our ministry. The assertion does not mean that, that ministers are justified in abusing or neglecting a congregation because they are too busy pleasing God. However, this does mean a happy congregation is not always a sure sign that a pastor is working with God's approval. Um, so that kind of reminds me of like, today how there's like a lot of false preachers you know just preaching whatever the congregation wants to hear so that they can like rack up members and you know get rich you know and it's not it's not always from god so so it's important to have the word with you because then god will speak through the minister and make sure that they're leading the congregation right um and also it goes back to the theme of grace so what some pastors didn't do way back when, um, and even probably still today, some, that it's how you said, like, grace, it's, it's hard to teach because, I mean, you might not, you know, like someone might not, um, like, understand it correctly, that grace is there for you when you fall, but, like, it does not make it okay for you to keep on sinning. So, um, that, like, both of those, spec like, both ends of the spectrum come into play with this statement, that you can please God by, um, you cannot please God by, like, basically neglecting to, to teach what he laid upon your heart, like, not following it correctly, mm -hmm. or you can not please God by not, um, and that also goes for grace, which is the other end, not showing that there is that loving relationship that can come from God, even when you do fall, so, mm -hmm. like, both, and there, you know, it's, it's hard, because, like, pastors want, uh, members, and, um, you gotta, you gotta find that, like, middle, yeah, that God, and God, only God can show you that, you know, you gotta find that middle where he will meet you, 
and he'll guide you on how to to teach those hard things um yeah and then this is a question that i don't know is kind of like relevant is which is beneath Letter B is, why does it seem at times we value the approval of others more than the approval of God? And I think it's just, we live in a world where, like, we want to be accepted. Like, you have social media, which people post all the time, and they, you know, you consider, you measure your value based on how many likes you get mm -hmm. on a certain post. And, like, if you don't get that many likes, then, like, people feel like they're not liked. And it's just, you can get really wrapped up in that. Mm -hmm. And that will make you feel like you're not valuable. Right. Um, so I, I think it's so important. And, like, I've even fallen victim to it. Just you look for validation. Right. And other people, and when they don't validate you, <laughs> it's like you start to go down this spiral of, like, oh, like, am I doing this right? Like, you just second guess everything. And, like, you know, the important lesson that I'm still learning is that, like, your validation comes from God. And... You know, you may do all these things for for the world. You may do all these things to please men, and, like, they will still fail you. Yeah. And the one thing that I've just, I'm trying to remember is that, like, God is constant. He will always be there for you. And no matter what, it's, it's important to realize that, like, only what he says matters at the end of the day. So... Do you guys have anything to say about that? or? Anything? Yeah, well, you hit it on the head. The question is, why does it seem at times we value the approval of others more than the approval of God? Um, and like you said, it goes to the, you said it perfectly. Um, we all have a need to be validated and accepted. Um, that is... That is innate in all of us. None of us escape that. Um, but how we process the lack thereof shows character. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes it doesn't even have to be anything to have to do with God. It's just the fact that we have always been, even with the in the vacuum of social media, yeah. we have always been wired to belong to something bigger than ourselves and those of a strong moral constitution uh, gravitate to others. Birds of a feather flock together. Yeah. So uh, we, we all tend to coalesce into these groups, whether big or small, and develop ideas and positions on whatever. So it's for us to not be a part of each other is is almost they call it antisocial. Mm -hmm. So it it, it 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 is something it is something that we are programmed to be. When we value what each other thinks and feels above what God has said, then then we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. And 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 this world has been constantly rearranging the chairs in that room and putting God further and further back into the room. To be honest with you, God is not even in the room anymore, mm -hmm. in my opinion. When I look out among and, and just recently even me and some of the co-workers were talking at how how dangerous it has become on the roads i drive trucks for a living and increasingly i am seeing blatant unnecessarily dis unnecessary disregard for basic traffic laws safety no one has any patience for anything anymore at all and more and see here's the thing that tickles me and i want you to think about this when i say this because i've seen this a hundred times get into a traffic jam especially one 
that is generally unexpected. There's some routes you take, you can expect some traffic, mm -hmm. right? But go a route that generally is considered normal. normal with no traffic at any point in time and let there be an accident or something that clogs traffic up. And then watch what happens. You'll have one guy yeah. jump out and drive on the shoulder. Yeah, I seen that. Right? around on the shoulder. I was like, you'll have one guy jump out and run down, drive down the shoulder and say, forget this, I'm going this way. Mm -hmm. And then instantly, because people see this person do it, yes. they jump out behind yeah. him. Up until the point where that one person did it, they may have thought about it, but decided no, because it's, okay. it's because they were bound by this moral, this, 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 I'm a part of this group, even though it's unpleasant, I'm a part of this group. And so I'm going to stay here like everyone else. But the minute someone gets out of the box, so to speak, and does something different, especially if it solves the problem at hand, People don't care whether or not it's right or wrong. It's only that they felt like what well, they felt justified in doing it. Anytime you felt if you have to justify your actions, that it's an indication, especially you have to justify your actions before you do it, then that's an indication that there's something wrong with you doing it. There's a popular saying going around that it's easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. So I've watched it a hundred times. Someone jump out on the shoulder and start driving. Everybody else jumps out on the shoulder and starts driving on the shoulder. But up until that point, that one guy jumped out on the shoulder. But until that point, all, all these other third of the cars just sat there. That's an example of where, how our bend towards uh, needing uh, others, validation and acceptance and affirmation and every just about everything we do is strong and so you need something stronger than that to counter mind when the crowd wants to take you to a place that you know you should not be and see what happens is people get to a place where they know they should not be or do things they know they should not do that god has taught against it and guess what to do it anyway, and they pre-justify it in their mind. And even when there's no proper justification for it, they still do it, and they run, and then they fall back on the very thing you're talking about. Well, God knows my heart, i.e., grace. All right. And see, these are these are predeterminations of iniquity. These are predeterminations of transgressions and sin. And we predetermine that we're justified in doing it. And even when we're not, and we know we're not, our heart is condemning us. We pull out the, the get out of jail free card of grace and say, well, you know, God loves me and God knows my heart. Right. Yeah, but you're not, and do you not know that when you sin, every time you sin, you put a bigger and bigger and bigger space between you and God. Yeah. And when you don't repent, you, that, that space Grace does not close that space. Every time you sin, grace keeps that space from becoming a death trap. But eventually, what happens is you get so far away from God, when you look, you can't even see him. Like I said, we as a society is, have moved God from the front of the room to the back of the room to the point now he's not even in the room. We, we predetermine and justify uh, our actions and we, we hide them under grace. And, and here's the, the most dangerous part. You have people, and I love the way the commentator said, just because you own a Bible doesn't make you a minister. Uh, I wanted to, to follow up on a thought you said. Notice what uh, the, the verse 15 says. The first word. What is the first word in that verse? Study. Study. Now, the the son. This is why I, I always say, you know, if you want a son, copy of the Sunday school lesson before today or after today, I can say I own all the copies. 
and I own the rights to distribute them. So I could send you a copy. I have no problem. Uh, I send my brother a copy of the Sunday school lesson in advance of the upcoming quarter, 12 lessons or 13 lessons I send them. And so you have, so, and, and the reason is because it makes studying easier. Um, but here's the problem. People study the word of God only to refute it. Not to say most, all people, but most people that I run into, they don't have questions about the word of God, genuine, authentic questions. They have questions that they've already answered in their mind, but want to debate with me. That's why he says, don't, don't, don't put, involve yourself in what he said in verse 16. He said, don't involve yourself. Um, uh, no, that's not what he meant. That's not what he's talking about right here. It says, um, uh, where is it? It says 16. Here it is, 18. Who concerning the truth of error, saying the resurrection. Oh, this is Hymenius. This is Hymenius. I think it was something else we read uh, further down. Chapter. Um, but Sorry, but he's. Chapter. Some vain, they increase more on God. There's something about avoiding questions uh, we read. Avoid Avoiding. Uh, basically useless questions mm -hmm. because you want just because people want to debate they want to debate I don't engage with debaters yeah I don't I, I, I make it a habit I don't engage with debaters if you want to debate the word of God you do that with someone else I'm not gonna waste my time because I'm I'm studying to show myself approved unto God and to help you and so my studying shows me not only what was said, but why it was said, who was speaking and who was they speak, who were they speaking to and why were they speaking to them in this way? And you have to study the word of God carefully because you have different, the word of God is not like any other book. Yeah. It's not written by a single author. It's written by multiple of authors over generations, thousands of years of being compiled. And so, and you have different writing styles. Uh, some writers speak rhetorically in the scriptures. And if you do not research them, you would take it in a literal form when he's speaking rhetorically. Uh, just as I give you a perfect example was a lesson we had last week when he said, uh, um, uh, um, he said, he said, um, and, and, and just to show you how how and without and, and without controversy, great is the mystery of God of godliness. And I always took that in a literal sense. But upon and reading it, I thought I was clear on what it was saying, and I was mostly clear. But it needed some more re, retuning. And come to find out that that is a rhetorical statement. Because there is no mystery to, godly, to godliness because he explained the godliness in the, in the following verses. And I missed that. So you, you, you need to know who's writing and what they're, why they're writing and what is the angle, purpose they're trying to achieve and who is the group. You know, we just came out of a series when, uh, of, the se of, the, of the seven churches, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 I, and if you read just read the scripture. You you think you understand what's being said. And what is being said is true. But then when you understand the places that were being that they were speaking to, and they were using analogies that the people understood in that locale. Right. And then was and, and, and I saw that and I was like, wow, isn't that something? You know, God is using stuff that they were very acute to to help them understand the danger that they were in and not following his word. The Bible says to study. Mm -hmm. It says to study. And, 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 and I wanted to emphasize, it doesn't say memorize. Though memory is nothing wrong. There are many scriptures I remember. My mother, when we got saved, used to have a poster. And I can't find this poster anymore, though they make one very similar to it, but not 
that poster. She got in a Bible bookstore and she posted, she stuck it up on the, uh, the, the, and she stuck it up on the basement in the ba- on the basement wall. She taped it up on the basement wall. So when you open up the basement door to walk down the stairs, that poster was staring at you. And it was all the names and of all the names that God has called. And every night before dinner, uh, we would we for a week we would recall uh one. Lion of the tribe of Judah, mm-hmm. Revelations 5.5. 5. See, I remember that. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Root of David, Revelation 22.16. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, um, but this was my mother. Then, and we got down maybe half of them. Okay? But my, this is something my mother did. Every night we sat down, we recall, we, and we would go from the first one, we memorized and go to the next one, memorized and kept building on top of them. Uh, we never got through, I think we got to maybe half, and then for whatever reason, we just didn't do it anymore. It's nothing wrong with memory. But understand, why is he called the root of David? Why is he called the lion of the tribe? You see what I'm saying? Your understanding is just, I believe your understanding of the scriptures is more important in your ability to recall chapter line and verse. Yeah. And, but I say that as a person who has a problem recalling chapter line and verse. But I know what it says. And, and, and this is why he told Timothy to study. Mm-hmm. Not only should you know what the scriptures say. You should know what they do not say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because you have many people coming along that, and just like the commentator said, just because you own a Bible doesn't make you a minister. Many people read the Bible to dispute the Bible. Many people read the Bible to dispute. I have arguments weekly on Facebook with people trying to take the. If you want to use, if if and oh and and you, I know some of you saying, well, you just said that you don't you don't believe in debating. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't believe in debating in the sense of trying to get you to see things my way. That's not what that's about. There are people that are watching that don't comment, but they're listening and they're watching what someone says. Oh, the Bible says this. Okay. And it, they may say something loosely, but the Bible says this. So this is okay because it says this over here. Okay. So it's not a, it's not a debate about, it's, it's no longer a debate about the issue. It's now a debate. It's, it, it's now a clarification of what you said. So I go behind the person. I have to clarify what was said. No, the Bible does not say that. People say a lot of things that they hear, but they never read. And they believe it's in the Bible because it has that kind of roll off the tongue. But it's not in the scriptures. And they use stuff that's not scripture to justify their sin. Mm-hmm. And so you have, I have to go behind them and, exp- and I have to credentialize myself. I have to bring my credentials into play. And, th- and so that when I speak, I, that, that, well, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to believe me, but I do know what I'm talking about. And so I have to go behind people and correct their misunderstanding, their misapplication of the Holy Scriptures. Why? Because someone else is somewhere on that thread and they're watching it. And they may have heard the same thing and started to believe what was being, what was said was true unless someone counters it. Right. That's why you got to study. So you not only know what is being said, but why it's being said. And you have to know what it is not saying. And one of the things that is not... You know, I had an argument just the other day with someone who said, Jesus, boy, I never heard this. Jesus never spoke against homosexuality. And I was like, huh? Mm -hmm. So, and I want to ask the person, how do you know that? Did you read the scriptures and find out that he never spoke against homosexuality? Or did someone tell you this? And so, instead of trying to argue and disprove them, I simply asked them, I said, well, he didn't he didn't preach for it either. He didn't he didn't condone it and he didn't preach against it. 
But you know why? Because he had already preached against it as God. He already spoke against it in the Old Testament. And That's those that are coming saying. and yeah. those that are coming after him reaffirmed what Jesus spoke in the Old Testament. I think the Paul Lord, Paul uh, came up behind it and yeah. clar made clarifications. Uh, and I, and another author came up behind and made clarifications to the activity. No, Jesus didn't specifically speak on it specifically, and you need not to. Because everyone, see, this is how when you study, you start to understand. Everybody that was Hebrew understood that this was detest, homosexuality was a detestable act. When, G, when the apostles began to teach about it, they were speaking to Gentiles who practiced it all the time. This was their culture. Homosexuality was inbred in the culture of the day. It was no surprise, but but to Hebrews, to Jewish people, this was a a, a sincere no, 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 no. We, this is not only a sin, but it's a detestable one. And so he was not speaking in Corinthians and in Romans. He was not speaking to Jews. He was speaking to Gentiles that had been converted to Christianity. So you see now, how did I know that? Because I under I, I studied. Corinthians, and I know who's talking, who's talking to who, and why. Right. Okay? And in 1 Corinthians, there's nothing but a list. 1 Corinthians is Paul's letter to the, the church in Corinth, the church, not sinners, the right. church, converts, Gentiles, yeah. the church in Corinth about their sinful ways right. and how upset he was about what he was hearing. 2 Corinthians is the follow-up to the 1 Corinthian letter, which commends them that they got the message and they got it right. See, how do you know that? You got to study. Yes. You got to say something. I think a lot of times, because in the New Testament, the reason why it's the New Testament, because as you just said, it follows a flow. Yes. From the beginning yes. to the yes. middle to the end. Until we all leave here. So I was meditating. It was something about grace. And for you to say that today is confirmation. Because the Heavenly Father showed me the reason why grace is such an issue. Because all of us all of us have the intentional reaction either to follow him or not. So at first it was just profound because he said, we're saved to be saved. The day that we stop being saved, we in trouble. And this is how grace can help us because we understand through God that's the only person that can save us. We can't save ourselves. And the day that we stop acknowledging him, not going through the practice of, um, of reverence with his mindset, his spirit, his Holy Ghost, everything pertaining to life and death is in the hands of who? God. When we stop acknowledging him, we in trouble. We living in a time now where we must acknowledge him. A lot of us forget yes. that God is the one that gives us life and death. A lot of us forget about his spirit breathing on us. His holiness. So when we stop being saved, then we're in trouble. He the only one can save us. We can't save ourselves. And that's how his grace and mercy comes together to help us. We don't take it for granted, but he shows us that it's needed in order to see another moment. You know, I told somebody, we used to say, all I need is one more day. We have to understand 
we cannot play with life anymore. We cannot do that anymore. Because the day that we stop acknowledging God, we in trouble. You can act like he don't exist. You can act like you don't need him. But we all know the day we rise up, what spirit you going to rise up in? Either it's going to be godly spirit or it's going to be the world spirit. We don't have no wavering anymore. So when we stop acknowledging him, we in trouble. You have to check in. Like you said, you have to check in to your heavenly father. You have to ask him to help you. You have to ask him to meet you every step of the way. And when we stop doing that, we in trouble. So he send people to pray for us, even though we may not understand it all the time. But some people didn't know how to pray for themselves. Yeah. We need help. We seriously need help daily, moment to moment, whenever we need it. So when you said um, about validation, so you know, the Holy Spirit showed me that we should leave people better than we found them. Mm -hmm. Because someone did it for us. Yeah. Someone did it for all of us. We we didn't know who was drawing us until God sent help. We didn't know until he sent help. And that's what we have to do for others. We have to be those people to help people. So when we go somewhere and we see a need, we sow that seed. So the people that may be in a predicament that we may not understand, we want them to feel better than we found them. It ain't always a momentary. It's 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 heartfelt. Yes. It's a service walk with thee, for real. We want to feel that God is really there to help us because sometimes He tells us to do things that, we, like you say, that make us feel so uncomfortable, and we don't understand it. But in His plan, He wants that individual to feel better than. We first met them, so when you leave, they feel better. I'm done. No, I, I agree. I agree. I think it's. I think it is definitely like heartfelt. You have to, like you, like you have to show love when you're, whenever you are, like helping someone because we don't. Like we've seen what happens when you don't. When people don't stay, you know, because. It's the love of God that like drew us. So we have to show that when we're trying to draw someone else, you know, we have to show that loving like side. And it's only God that can help you do that because if he wants you to go help somebody who's, who was like your enemy, you know, who you haven't forgiven yet, which is happening to me, like someone that you haven't forgiven yet, someone that you still are carrying that pain you know, it's hard and only God can help you to do what he wants you to do in that moment. Only God can. And um, it's it's a love that we don't, we as humans don't know, but it's something that like when God gives it to you, like it's, it's fully spiritual because yeah, you, know, it. you can't, you can't do it on your own. And it's hard to compliment, comprehend it on your own, you know? If you're not using your spiritual eyes, then like, you'd be like, no, I'm not doing this. like. You want me to go talk to who? Like, you want me to help who? Pick up who? Give who? Like, it's it's so easy to be like, no. But like, when those moments come, when those moments come, like, you have to realize and and remember that God did it for you, so that He'll give you the strength to do it for someone else. Yeah. But it's so easy, you know. Um. So just kind of like finishing up, I guess, highlighting some of the themes of the lesson. Um, the Bible is, studying the Bible is so important for, on 17, page 17, 
it says, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. So outside of, um, it's always, and it talks also about um, interpretation that you receive from communities. So like from the pastor, from other members of the church that have gone through what you're gone through and those that God have put in place as leaders it's important to receive that interpretation because like my dad's or like the pastor said um the bible is written in like historical different historical settings so it's important to know what the writers were meaning in that certain time and then if if it's hard i know it's always been hard for me to sometimes like get the meanings of different things so i may like read the king james aside like like esv or um another one niv just to get like the translation correct Mm -hmm. um and like better understand it i tell you what's even better um especially if you have a hard time i i I always teach um that if you read other translations read like you say read it side by side because two things happen when you do that like you showed me one One is that you are being, you're training your brain to recognize terms that are used Mm -hmm. in the, in, in the Bible, though they're not all synonymous. They use terms interchangeably. It depends on the setting. Like one word can be, you, I give you a perfect example. Love, the word love has actually seven different meanings and uh, four of them are found in the scriptures and they all mean something different. But you see the word love, mm-hmm. and you think it's the same love, but it's not. And so when you research, you find that there's use interchangeably depending on the setting. And so that's what studying does. It teaches you, but when you read side by side, it gives you understanding of what you're reading, and it's also training you to be able to read the King James Version and yeah. understand. That's the first thing it does. But most importantly, what it does and for me is... If I'm reading the a uh, new interpretation, a new example, mm-hmm. I'm confirming that what they transferred from the King James is still there, mm-hmm. because I've had one Bible that it took complete scriptures out. All right, so. 23, 24, 26. What happened? Verse 25, mm-hmm. completely gone because they didn't think it fit, and so I'm reading side by side to make sure that everything is supposed to be there. Yeah. You know, um, just so that, you know, I don't get lost in the new, this new, what you call it, you know, mm-hmm. um, it's, in, but one of the most, one of the most, the biggest ways I help to understand some of the scriptures, you're not going to believe this, was reading your guys' children Bible. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I know a lot of preachers that read the children's Bible. Yeah, because he wants you to have, you know, he tra- the one thing about the Lord, he tried to put it in a place that even a child can obtain. That's, that's true in some respects, but not in every respect. Because there are a lot of things written in the scriptures that a child will never understand. And so I'll give you a perfect example was understanding the genealogy of David's family, especially after Solomon, and how the kingdom mm-hmm. split. And if you read it in uh, if you read it in Chronicles and in First Kings, and there might be somewhere else you, that that actually has it, then you will start to you'll get lost mm-hmm. because you're like, what Israel? And then there's Judah. And what happened? And then. You can get lost and and it's confusing. And a lot of times the author, the way he wrote, because of the writing style of that day, will write something in duplicate and it will confuse you. But the children Bible, it kind of helped me in that regard. It cut right through all of the extra stuff and just gave me what was there instead of all the fluff. Um, And there's nothing wrong with the fluff, but sometimes it confuses Mm-hmm. You know, and that children's Bible I bought y'all was is, is is part of my library. Mm-hmm. So I mean, you you, but I read it alongside. You know what I'm saying, so that I could get a full understanding of what's being said. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, and then just kind of like a last point is part B on page 17 says that um, in order to fully respect God's word, we must approach God's word for what it is rather than what we would have it to be. Um, so it kind of goes into like how you were saying that like people will try to like use the Bible to um, as an excuse for their sin or like um, as a way to make their sin okay or even to do certain things that maybe God didn't explicit, explicitly say was was sin. But like as you read the scriptures, you know that this is not something godly or something I should be doing. And so that comes from reading and like it's just so important to have like to just be open to like what the word says because you know there's certain things that like he may tell each of us to to do that he may not tell anyone else certain things certain sacrifices i mentioned like one of the things that came into mind was sacrifice that you'll get from reading the word it may not necessarily be a sin but it's something that will bring you closer to him um so it's, it's just so important to I think just to have an open mind to um and and like for someone who's going from listening to a false preacher to listen to someone who is preaching truth it's important to, like that's a whole different dynamic but it's just so important to have an open mind because mm -hmm. like the preacher is the preacher and being led by god but you know, God may give you something else while you're reading the scriptures. So, mm -hmm. you know, to just have an open mind to, I don't, whatever, I, I read the Bible just because, one, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard for me to understand. Um, or, you know, I, I may not know what to read because I'm like, oh, my gosh, this book is so big. And, like, I don't know where to start, you know. And I try to start, I'll look up in the back. My uh, The Bible that my dad gave me has, like, a little... Is it concordance or something? Well, there's there's several different parts. The concordance is basically a word for was like a, a a word list of every word yeah. used in the book. Then you have uh, topical concepts like the life of David, the life of Paul, the life of different. One. Then you have other. You have a lot of. There's a lot of material in there that you know helps shrink that huge Bible down to concepts and topics. Yeah. yeah. I I'll start there if I'm like, you know, I'm like, okay, well this is what I struggle with. I need to I need to read something about peace today. Or right. Like purity right. or right. um what's another one. Like fear, which is a big one. So I'll just go there and start. And then I'll pray that God will just let me understand what I'm reading. So, um, those, you, that's a good practice. You know, one of the things that helped me, um, and as we close, we could just close on, 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 one of the things that helped me was those topical issues in the back. Yeah. And whenever you find yourself, you know, you, you you research that one specific issue and by bombard mm -hmm. your free time on that issue. Yeah. And just so you know, you could come to a passage of scripture, read it, and you can get something from it. But then come back several years later, read it again, and get something in addition. It's like it's alive mm -hmm. and it's growing with you or something. It's really weird how the Bible is. Um Another thing is, um, that's why I love Sunday school, because Sunday school lessons give you something, a format to work on. So, you know, you can, like what you did was, you didn't just read the focus text, but you went above and beyond it to get a full setting. And that's, that's, that's one way to do it is to, take the Sunday school lesson and just explode the Sunday school lesson and let that be your focus. Another way that has helped me is very, especially recent in, the, in my recent level of growth. When you're reading something and you don't know what it is, or there's a word 
that you don't know. You know, and why are they using this word? You know, something, and you feel like, what is, what is profane and vain babblings? What is that? And then you research that. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You know, you go and you find text and you research and try to find out why did he say that? Mm -hmm. You know, whenever you have that process hit you, like why? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a that's an impetus to study, mm -hmm. to tear it apart and find out what 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 did he mean? Why? And then you get a you're like oh, and it adds a little 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 kernel, a little nugget of knowledge. It help and and you don't know it, but what you did was you put it's like putting a to me studying is like a puzzle, mm -hmm. a grand biblical puzzle. And every time I study and learn something, I put a puzzle piece in place. It, it, so, though I don't understand it, there's a lot of stuff I read, I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Like, you never, you hardly ever see me teach on eschatology. Because I don't, eschatology is the doctrine and teaching of the end times. Uh, Revelation. Revelation. Revelation, Thessalonians, M Matthew, Daniel, Isaiah. That's eschatology. That's talking about the end times. And you don't see me hardly ever teaching and preaching on the end times because I'm still studying it. Because there's a lot of stuff in there that's hard. There's a lot of imagery, mm -hmm. you see. So it's it's nothing wrong. It's like, why did he say that? There are reasons behind it. And you research, you find it. And the Bible is his best commentator. It it, com it comments on itself. Mm -hmm. You it, it helps when you read other people's meditations and what they got from what is written. But the Bible explains itself inside of itself. You need no external source, uh, source mm -hmm. but they help. Yeah, they do help. So, yeah, that's all I have. Um, this favorite lesson on the importance of reading the Bible. But yeah, that's all I have. The the Word of God is powerful, and when you know it, uh, Sister Adriel brought up something. Um, and, and, and I just wanted to stress it. Um, it's more important to understand what it says than, the, than, than, than to memorize it. Memory is a beautiful thing. It's okay, but it's more important to understand it. What is it really saying? And how does that apply to me? And when you do that, when you approach it from, it's, you know, people say, well, I read a chapter a day. Listen, it's not about, it's not about, it's not about how much you read. It's about what you retain and what you understand. So if you read two or three verses and you and and, and it's like, okay, what does that mean? You know, um, and then see in the scriptures, some of the Bibles they put the thoughts and they have to put paragraph notations yeah. to let you know this is a slightly different thought pattern than the above scriptures and so you know you read up to that point that's one little thought pattern maybe you'll read that and you'll meditate on that during the day or maybe you'll take if you have a problem with lust then you'll find I mean, this is what i did i found every scripture in the bible that dealt with lust and i would read it i, I used to struggle with anger controlling my anger guess what i did i went and found every scripture in the bible on anger i wrote it down and i would read those scriptures daily and within a week in a week's time a week of reading that I didn't even have I was not sensitive it's like it insulated me against the triggers that were triggering my anger um, and I wouldn't always re react but the, I could feel it burning in me the anger wanting to express itself and when I started seeing those I said okay something's not right in my spirit and I read every scripture that I could find there are several scriptures I wrote down I wrote them down with my hand, and every morning I would read them out loud. And when a week's time, the stuff, the same stuff that was bothering me a week ago, bar barely registered, very barely caught my attention. And so the Bible is used as a medicine, it's used, the scriptures is used, they're powerful and they work. If you have a problem with faith, if you, whatever you have a problem with, there are there are teachings. And there are scriptures in there dealing with it. And when you search them out and you read them, you get the benefit. 
But and then so that's just the scriptural aspect. But when you study and un uncover the how, the whys, and the whats, oh, then you really into something. Because then you begin to see, you begin to see it differently. It, it unfolds in front of you. At least it does for me. Yeah. So as you just stated, it took me a long time to understand why we said the Bible was the living word. And then once I meditated on that, it's because it's just like being a good parent. You could tell a child to do something, but by you telling him or her to do something, it's one thing. What they see you do is everything. Yeah. So the activation of the Spirit of the Lord has to be applied to your life every day, every moment, every minute. And that's how the Word of the Lord becomes the Spirit of the Lord in your life. It's like a rebirthing. Yeah. Even though we've been born biologically, but born again is His Spirit into your life and that's how the living word become it's like an injection of power and of his holiness and of the glory of the lord in your life and and and, and willingness to understand his yielding spirit for your life mm -hmm. to continue to be in his presence. Yeah. So it took me, a, you know, like you say, you hear things sometimes like, you know, the pastor say you hear it, but until you actually, you know, let it connect. Mm -hmm. The same way we reboot a computer or we um, connect the power, mm -hmm. it, it gives you that same energy. Yeah, the connection with God. Yes, it's 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 the ultimate connection with Him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we we uh. Oh, she was on. Uh. We uh lost uh. We uh lost uh i think we're back though uh okay oh sister russell we didn't something's been wrong with this yeah um hey my brother's on here sister russell was here praise the lord he said i'm over something um but we we um we're thankful for yeah we do we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna go ahead and end it because we had some problems uh, the feed dropped off and everything didn't even see uh, the comments, but um, we thank God for those of you that have made it on the view. And um, we're going to go ahead and close this out. We're a little bit over our time, but uh, we're going to go ahead and close this out. Um, this has been Winfield Pentecostal in Crown Point, Indiana. I'm the pastor, Elder Cameron Mabel. This is my wife, Evangelist Deidre Mabel, and uh, our daughter. Our secretary treasurer, uh, Sister Adrielle Mabel. This has been Sunday School, um, uh, June the 13th, 2021. Uh, and the title of our lesson was Study Rightly Dividing the Word out of the uh, Living Word series, Word of Flame, volume number three. And so uh, we're going to close out. Uh, if you would like to get in touch with us, you can do so through WPAssembly at Outlook.com. We have uh, evening worship service every Sunday evening at 5 p.m. at 7416 East 109th Street in Crown Point, Indiana. And if you would like to donate to the ministry, you can do so through the Givelify app, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y, and look for Winfield Pentecostal Assembly and make your donation. If you would like a uh, copy of the Sunday School lessons that we just taught, 
uh, just email me at wpassembly at outlook.com. And that's it. Thank you for, for those of you that hung on. Uh, we're sorry for the technical difficulty. Um, those of you that commented and everything and participated, we thank you very much. Uh, but we're going to end and let you get on with your Sunday. Thank God for you. In Jesus' name, this is Winfield Pentecostal signing out. Amen.